Hey guys, welcome back. I wanted to talk today a little bit more about some details of exactly how that nephron really does the, the job that it does, how it's able to really filter the blood, reabsorb the good stuff, but also how those processes are controlled. So a little bit more detail about how the nephron works. Now just as a quick little review, this is what we kind of talked in the little, talked about in the last little um, you know, lecture that we had. Remember, this is the uh, typical nephron. You have that um, cortical radiate artery going into the afferent arteriole that feeds into the glomerulus. That's where everything is filtered, right? The glomerular capsule is what captures all that filtrate. It's then passed through the convoluted tubes, both the pot proximal and the distal. They absorb all the good stuff back into the blood where it's recaptured by this paratubular capillary. All that good stuff is then dumped into this blue um, cortical vein, which then eventually goes to the um, the renal vein, right? All the stuff that we didn't want, extra fluid, extra waste, extra salts, all the stuff we don't need gets dumped into the collecting duct where it then eventually makes its way uh, to the bladder, okay? So that's kind of um, the, the, the quick review. Now what I wanted to focus on is exactly how these convoluted tubes are able to reabsorb that good stuff, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna zoom in on one little section that involves um, a little piece of the convoluted tube um, next to one of these paratubular capillaries. So that's kind of what I've drawn right here. I'm using the same color scheme. In green, this is a little section of um, uh, the, the, the convoluted tube. Okay, so the convoluted tube is gonna be kind of made up of these cuboidal epithelial cells, which kind of line, they make up the walls of this convoluted tube. They're cuboidal because they're doing all this hard work to reabsorb all this good stuff. So we're gonna have all these cuboidal cells which are right here and right here. And they really make up the wall of um, this tube, right? So this is the, a little piece of the convoluted tube. It could be the proximal or the distal, it doesn't really matter, okay? And um, this is the inside of the convoluted tube and this is the wall of the convoluted tubule. So we'll just call this um, the proximal convoluted tubule, okay? So I'm just gonna abbreviate that PCT, okay? This little space on the outside of it, that's just interstitial fluid. That's just the fluid and space that's outside of the cell itself. However, what we have over here, this is gonna be a little piece of the paratubular capillary, all right? Its walls are gonna be made up of uh, simple squamous epithelial cells, which kind of look like this, right? Kind of piled on top of each other, much thinner cells than the walls of the convoluted tubule. They'll have nuclei as well, okay? And then here, this is the inside of that paratubular capillary. Now, we want this, all the stuff that we filtered out of the blood to go from here to there, and this is how it works. First thing that we're gonna do is that we are going to pump sodium, okay? So what I'm gonna do is we'll do a little color scheme or try to do a little color scheme. And we're gonna view sodium in this orange color, okay? So sodium is in this orange color. We're gonna pump sodium from the inside of this uh, cell that makes up the wall, the convoluted tubule, to the interstitial space. Okay, that's gonna take energy and it's gonna take ATP. We're really powering the sodium potassium pump. But we're pumping sodium from this way to this way. What's that gonna cause the concentration of sodium to do inside this cell? It's gonna cause the concentration to go down, right? Well, there's plenty of sodium left in the middle of the convoluted tubule because that's the fluid that we just filtered out of the blood. Now, if sodium concentration goes down inside the cell and it's high inside the tube, that means that sodium is going to passively diffuse back into that um, epithelial cell, okay? And it's gonna diffuse back um, pretty readily because we're pumping all that sodium out. Well, we're gonna use that flow of sodium going from the inside of the tube to the inside of the cell to power the co-transport of some really valuable chemicals like sugars, um, out of the convoluted tubule, okay? So we're gonna use co-transport, sodium co-transport. So sodium co-transport powers the absorption of sugars into sodium epithelial cell. We'll call these sugars in blue, okay? So that means that we're gonna allow these sugars in blue to be absorbed into that epithelial cell 
along with the sodium through co transport. Basically, the sugars are hitching a ride. It's almost like, imagine there's a river of sodium. You're just throwing the sugars into that river and they flow along with the sodium. Um, that's a good thing because the concentration of sugars is increasing in this epithelial cell. Is the concentration of sugars high or low in this blood vessel? It's low because there's nothing there. Remember, this just came out of the glomerulus. So this is gonna mean that these sugars are gonna passively diffuse into that paratubular capillary, along with all this sodium, okay? That's a good thing. We've been able to reabsorb all that good stuff. Now, um, what's water gonna do? If we move salt somewhere, what's water gonna do? It's gonna follow it. Remember, water always follows salt. We've moved a bunch of salt into the blood vessel. Water is simply gonna follow it, all right? So water's also gonna simply follow the movement of the salt into the blood vessel. So water follows salt, okay? And this water is in this dark blue, okay? Now, and of course the water goes through these um, aquaporins, which are little channels that allow water flow, and this happens passively. Now, as all of these things kind of leave, as water leaves the convoluted tubule, this is gonna cause the saltiness of everything that's left behind to increase, right? Water's leaving, so the concentration of things like lipids, um, other ions, hormones are gonna increase, right? That's gonna cause them to passively move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We'll use this in pink. So everything else that's important, like hormones, lipids, right, ions, they're gonna passively diffuse from an area of high concentration to low concentration as well. Okay, so three follows. Everything else follows. So basically, the only thing we were really had to actively move was this solid orange arrow and sodium. Once we did that, everything else followed and passively diffused into this paratubular capillary. Things like water, sugars, nutrients, lipids, hormones, everything that we want to keep passively moves to where we want it to go. And if you think about it, that's super cool. We only had to pump one thing, everything else kind of passively followed, okay? So the um, movement of sodium is really what powers reabsorption of everything else into the paratubular capillary. So I'm just gonna abbreviate this, the capillary, okay? Okay, so that's kind of the first point I wanted to make. The second point is we need to talk a little bit more about how the nephron is really able to control how quickly things move through those tubes, those convoluted tubes. Just as a quick review, um, let's draw out another little picture of the nephron. All right, so we know what this guy looks like. We start out with um, a tiny little afferent arteriole, which comes into the glomerulus. So there's the afferent arteriole. The glomerulus looks like there's a big kind of tangled up ball of capillaries, which are filtering everything, all right? And then the efferent arteriole emerges from it like that, okay? Wrapped around that glomerulus is the glomerular capsule. This guy is gonna look kind of like this. Glomerular capsule kind of encases the glomerulus, kind of like that, all right? And then emerging from that glomerular capsule, we're gonna have the proximal convoluted tubule, which is a big windy series of tubes. That proximal convoluted tubule is then gonna give way into the nephron loop, which comes down and then comes back up. Now here's something that we didn't mention, and I left this out in the previous illustration of the nephron. When that Nephron loop comes back up. We have the ascending limb. He's gonna go right beside the glomerulus. In fact, he's gonna go right there, okay? Right between the afferent and efferent arterioles. Then after he goes there, he's gonna squiggly all around like he did before, and eventually he's gonna meet up with the brown um, collecting duct, okay? Which is right here, okay? So that collecting duct's right there. Now, something important happens when that nephron loop comes right back up here to the glomerulus, something really important happens. So we're gonna zoom in on this little area and I'm gonna redraw it, okay? So this, this little area actually has a name. It's called the juxtamedullary complex. So, juxta 
Medu Larry complex. Okay, in order to draw this, I'm going to draw the kind of large afferent arteriole, which kind of comes in like this. Okay, so there's our large afferent arteriole that gives way to the glomerulus. Okay, so there we have the glomerulus, this big tangled up ball of capillaries, right, which are just pushing out all this stuff. They're filtering everything kind of like this, a little bit more red, just to make it kind of, yeah, that looks nice. And so we have all these capillaries, which are filtering everything out. And then that is then going to give way to the efferent arteriole, which is a little bit smaller, right? So the efferent arteriole comes out like that. Now, what I'm going to draw is I'm going to draw where that ascending limb of the nephron loop comes up. And... So he's gonna come over here, and this guy is gonna come right through the space between those two um, arterioles, okay? And that forms the juxtamedullary complex. The ascending limb of the nephron loop, which is coming in like this, and then he is gonna go right there. And I'm gonna make it so we can look inside this guy and see what's going on, okay? And this little union is called the paratubular capillary. Let me label some of this stuff. This is the, um, basically the first part of the distal convoluted tubular. So we'll call this the ascending limb of nephron loop. He's right there. Okay, this is the afferent arteriole. there and this is the efferent arteriole right there okay so there's a special collection of really nice little cells right here okay these guys in blue that I've just drawn those are called the macula densa cells so macula densa Cells, and they are located right there. What these guys do is they are monitoring how much salt is in this little part of the, the nephron loop, okay? And they do something in turn that's really cool. If the salt in this tube is too high, that means that the fluid is moving too fast through the convoluted tubule and these cells of the convoluted tubule didn't have enough time to reabsorb the salt. So if there's too much salt in here, that means that things are moving too fast through the tube and these guys didn't have enough time. What we need to do is we need to slow how the, the speed of fluid down in the nephron. What will happen is if the salt's too high, the macula densa cells will cause these granular cells which are hanging out inside the walls of the afferent arteriole. So these are like special granular cells which are hanging out in the walls of the aff afferent arterioles. So these are granular cells. These guys are made up of smooth muscle. They contract and they're gonna squeeze that afferent arteriole and make it get smaller. If it gets smaller, that means less fluid can come into the glomerulus. That means that less fluid is gonna get filtered and it's gonna slow down the speed of fluid in the entire nephron. If it slows down the speed of fluid, that means that these um, cells can reabsorb, have more time to reabsorb what they need to, and that's gonna reduce the amount of salt in the convoluted tubule by the time it gets back to the juxtamedullary complex. Now, if there's too little salt, the opposite's gonna happen. If, if, there's not, if there's hardly any salt in this convoluted tubule, that means that this fluid's moving too slow, and these epithelial cells are absorbing too much. Right? That means we need to speed things up. The macula densa cells are also going to detect that. They're going to tell these granular cells to relax. The afferent arteriole gets bigger. More fluid comes in. Filtration rate increases. The, the speed of fluid going through the nephron goes faster. And that's going to um, prevent the epithelial cells from absorbing as much. And everything's good. Okay? So think about this. This is super cool. By monitoring how much sodium, sodium alone, is in the, the ascending limit of the nephron loop right here. We can control 
how everything gets absorbed. Things from urea to salts to vitamin C. You ever wonder like if you take like 10 doses of emergency, how the body knows only to keep what it needs. This is how. It's just gonna monitor how much salt is in the nephron if there's too much, just sodium. Now we're not measuring vitamin C, we're just measuring sodium. By measuring the appropriate amount of sodium, we're automatically gonna absorb the appropriate amount of vitamin C, right? Just because of how quickly things can move through this tube. Everything left over just goes straight to the bladder and the urine and you, you just pee it out. Okay, so a pretty cool example of kind of how things work. Now, one more thing I wanted to mention about um, the glomerulus. One thing I haven't mentioned before is if we zoom in on one of these tiny little capillaries of the glomerulus, so let's zoom in on one of these guys and I'll just draw them right here. Okay, so here's like one little example of, of the capillary, the glomerulus. Remember, this guy is going to be made up of a bunch of different fenestrations, right? So you're going to have one of these capillaries. It's going to be loaded with all these little fenestrations. I'll kind of draw these like this, all these little fenestrations, which are located in the walls of this capillary, allowing everything to move out. Well, remember, the only thing we want to leave, um, the only things we want to keep inside this capillary are blood cells and proteins. Sometimes proteins leak out, and that's not a good thing. Um, we actually are gonna have a specialized cell that wraps around this capillary. This cell looks crazy. This cell looks like a little alien, which is hanging out on top of the capillary itself. I'm gonna draw this guy in um, this blue color. So imagine there's this um, cell that's hanging out on top of this capillary. I'm gonna draw him in blue. And he has these weird little arms that like wrap around the capillary itself like this. Okay. All right, I'm trying to color this guy in. He's still a little, paper's still a little wet, that's okay. All right, so this little cell is hanging out on top of this capillary, wrapping around the capillary with these little arms. Then he has these little appendages, which act like filters, and they're gonna catch any proteins that happen to leak through that capillary. If it catches proteins, it's gonna return it back into the circulatory system. So this guy is called a podocyte, and his job is to catch all the proteins that have leaked out of the capillaries of the glomerulus and return them to the circulation. And it's not just one of these guys. These guys are distributed all along these capillaries. You'll probably have another one right here, right? And he's wrapping his little arms or appendages around the um, capillary as well. All right, my marker's dying. But you guys get the point, right? You have all these little podocytes and their job is to capture all the proteins that have leaked through. All right. That's it. All right. Thanks.